we and many other creatures share a mechanism for what you might call extracting numerosity or the number of things from the environment. It's really very important for all sorts of creatures and for all sorts of reasons. Extracting numerosity from the environment, what does that mean? What I mean by this is that a fish needs to know how many other fish are in a shoal so it can join the larger shoal. So the numerosity of fish in shoals is important. Lions need to know how many invading lions into their territory there are. Usually this is done through sound, they can hear them coming, so they can decide whether to flee or to fight. So this is just extracting the number of things from the environment. Because they have to decide what's relevant in the environment. So the lions are paying attention to the number of roars that they can hear and the number of distinct roarers. The fish are paying attention not to the, the seaweed, but just to other fish that are swimming around. So they have to focus on a particular set of objects. So this is a mechanism that fish and lions and, and we share. At least we think we share them. We certainly have similar mechanisms. Whether all these mechanisms come from a, a common ancestor or not, I don't know. I and mean, this requires genetic research. At the moment, that's not available. Professor, do animals need to know the number or do they just need to know a greater than, or equal sort of thing? Do they know, okay, there's more on the left than the right? They don't need to extract an actual number, do they? Sometimes that's enough. Having a, you know, a rough sense of how many there are may be sufficient. So if you've got a lot of fish swimming around in a shoal, let's say 100 fish over here versus 50 fish over there, you're not going to be able to enumerate them. But you've got to have a way of, of extracting at least approximate numerosity from that. The way in which that's done is probably something like this. You kind of extract the approximate density of the fish. Then you see how big an area these fish cover. So you could, it's basically density times area than fish fish can do that. Sometimes you need to do it exactly. So if there are three lions defending against four lions, they need to know that there's just one more of them. Then they have a decision to make. If we're four and they're three, then we attack, we defend our territory. So sometimes you need to know it exactly. Sometimes approximate will do. One proposal came out in the early 80s is that we all possess an accumulator. And so the more things that you experience, the fuller the accumulator gets. Let me give you a, a helpful analogy. Supposing I've got a, a jug, let's say with marks on it, and for each thing I see, I have a cup of water and I pour it into the jug. So for each thing, however big the thing is, it's the same cup of water or whatever the thing is, it's the same cup of water. So if I see three things, then the jug will be filled to there. If I see four things, it'll be to there, five things to there, up to about 10 things. This is a very simple mechanism. There's evidence now, at least in frogs, that there's a particular neuron that does this. In monkeys, there's evidence that there's a uh, there's single neurons that seem to behave like one of these accumulators. That is, the more things that the monkey sees, the more this particular neuron fires. So there's, I know this is number five, so I can say this, a monotonic relationship between the number and the firing rate. In the case of other animals, it may not be firing rate, it might be done in some other way. We don't know. Uh, it may be done within a neuron or it may be done in terms of connections between neurons. Let me give you an example from frogs. Now, most people think frogs are pretty stupid, but here um, they perhaps tell us humans something that we ought to have known all along. So imagine these, these particular species of frogs that have been studied. They're in a swamp and they want to mate, and the male wants to mate with a female, so it has to attract a female. The female can't see it, and he can't see the female. So it's mating is done by uh, by sound. So what the male frog has to do is... Well, the choice of a mate, at least, not the mating itself. Not the, no, That's true, not the mating itself, but the choice of a mate uh, depends on sound. What the male has to do, it has to make it appear that it is the most, the fittest male in the swamp. And it does this by making a series of noises called chucks. I'm... I'm well, 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 well. Okay, I'm not very good at frog noises. The female will be attracted by the number of chucks in a phrase, because the more chucks you can make, more fit, more substantial you are. Now, number's important. It's better than volume, because volume will depend upon how far away you are from the male. But number doesn't depend on how far away you are from the male. And it turns out that frogs compete with each other. 
So if I make five chucks, my neighboring male might make five plus one chucks. And this might escalate until you reach the limit of how much breath you can have to make a, a number of chunks in the phrase. It's like an auction. That's, it is, it's a bit like an, an auction. Now, why this might, I don't know if it applies to humans that if you make a lot of noise or more noises, you're more likely to attract a mate. But anyway, that's the way it works in frogs. Now, what's interesting is that Gary Rose at the University of Utah, he showed that there's a neuron in the brain of the frog that seems to act like an accumulator. Uh, so it, it hears the number of chucks made by uh, another frog and it thinks, hello, he's made five, I have to make an extra one. So then it will generate an extra chuck to make it six chucks. So uh, it's not only counting the number that the other guy made, it has to count how many it makes. That's right. It has to, yeah, I've only been making four, so I better, I better up my game. So it, it looks as though there's, there is uh, something rather like an accumulator in the, in the brain of, of the frog. Now we don't know much about it for other, the brains of other creatures, and we don't know whether there's an equivalent mechanism in our brain, but there's no reason why there shouldn't be. So for example, when we think about timing, there's a gene which you can find in the fruit fly, which we're only very, very distantly related to, called TIM which is a timing gene, which responds to a particular interval. Now it turns out this TIM gene is conserved in us. Now we use it in a rather different way from the, the fruit fly and it combines with other genes and other mechanisms to make our timing mechanism more general uh, and more detailed than the fruit fly. But you know, if there's a, a gene in the fruit fly for time, there could be a gene in the frog or, or even in insects who can also count for counting which we share with them and which builds an equivalent type of mechanism. You use the analogy of like a measuring cylinder yeah. or a vessel being filled. Yeah. In an actual brain, what is being filled? <laughs> like where is where's this stuff being stored? What's being filled up to accumulate into? I can imagine the pulses from the neurons, but yeah. how are they stored? Yes, that's, that's a very, very good question. And it's one that is extremely controversial. You've hit on a very raw, or should I say nerve, um, here. So one argument, which has been made by Randy Gallister at Rutgers University, and, and he was also, uh, in fact, he was one of the co-organizers of this meeting. He argues that things like time and number are actually stored in polynucleotides in, in the neuron itself. And this is gonna have an effect on the way in which the neuron connects with other neurons. Another idea is that it's got to do with the connections between neurons. There have been some modeling exercises, usually neural networks, where either the network learns to recognize a particular numerosity like fiveness, because if it's fiveness, it goes into a particular state and the virtual neurons connect up in a particular way and if it's not five then they connect up in a different way or it can just be some kind of internal mechanism which for example to harness proposed whereby a network of neurons can organize itself into say two-ness or three-ness or four-ness or five-ness roughly speaking so does that mean as each accumulation happens the neural network says okay let's move into fourness position oh there's been another one let's move into fiveness position oh now we're going to go into sixness position yeah that's that's what the neural network people would say and it's not entirely clear how that's going to work that's one of the the, the, the current controversies but in a simple accumulator mechanism it will be a single neuron that responds to a particular numerosity of whatever it happens to be tuned to. If it's, let's say, tuned to the number of sounds it hears, that's what it will respond to. So it'll respond more to fiveness than to fourness. And in fact, there is some evidence that in monkey cortex and indeed in the kind of homologous part of bird brain, there are individual neurons that respond preferentially to particular numerosities. So if the monkey sees an array of five, this neuron will respond more to five than to fourness or to sixness. And similarly in the bird brain. There is evidence for single neurons acting as an accumulator. In fact, in the monkey brain, the number neurons seem to be in a cleft in the parietal lobe. So the parietal lobe's round there, and there's a kind of a fold and at the bottom of the fold technically the fundus. There are these number neurons. If the number neurons are down there, on the lateral surface here, there are going to be accumulator neurons. 
are sometimes called summation neurons, which fire more when they experience more things. And it's believed, though it's not been yet demonstrated, that there's a connection between these neurons, these accumulator neurons, and the number neurons. So if this accumulator neuron gets to fiveness, then it will activate down here the neuron which preferentially responds to fiveness. So that's the way people think it works at the moment. If we've seen this accumulator perhaps working mm. in the frog, which yeah. is very exciting, why haven't we been able to see it in humans that we probably study even more than frogs? Why has it not shown itself yet? Ah, uh, well, that's an interesting question, and, and that's because we can uh, use very fine electrodes to probe the brains of frogs. And at the moment, we're not allowed to do that with uh, humans, unless, for example, it's in the course of surgery. So, for example, in intractable epilepsy, the surgeon would like to remove the epileptic focus, but the surgeon would like to do that without damaging the parts of the brain that the patient really needs. So you have to find out which bits of the brain are, are really important to the patient. And what you do is you open up the skull, you put a grid of electrodes on the exposed brain, and then you see with various tests which parts of the brain, rather selectively now, just a few thousand neurons, respond, let's say, to speech or to particular words, or in this case, to particular numbers. And so what, for example, Joseph Parvizi in at Stanford has done is he's found neurons or perhaps neuron clusters that respond to particular digits. So in part of the brain down there, um, which is where you do some of your visual processing, there seem to be little clusters of neurons that respond to the digit five, though not to fiveness, okay, not to the numerosity five. And now there's some other work done by Carlo Semenza in Italy at the University of Padova. And what he does is something slightly different. With epileptic patients, what he does is he stimulates the brain in such a way that it temporarily disables the bit that's being stimulated. So he's been looking at calculation. So there are particular bits of the brain which, if you stimulate them, stops you doing addition, but not multiplication. And another bit that stops you doing multiplication, but not addition. So it looks as though, although addition and multiplication are spread over several different sites, each particular site, just a few thousand neurons, is doing a particular arithmetical operation. These people have to be conscious for, for them to know. Yes, they have to be conscious, that's right. So we open up the, well, not me personally, but the brain is opened up and the person has to be conscious, or, or else the, the surgeon doesn't know what the different bits of the brain are doing. Who are the people that really want to know this, the inner workings of how our brain's dealing with numbers? One of the problems is that uh, not everybody's very good at learning arithmetic. Now, there are many different branches of mathematics, and uh, some people are not very good at arithmetic but are very good at geometry. We've tested some of those. Some people are not very good at geometry, but are very good at arithmetic, and we've tested some of those. So we're talking really here about arithmetic, because this is the closest we get to what animals can do. So there are some people who, despite every opportunity, don't seem to be able to develop arithmetic in the uh, normal way. Now, if they've inherited a mechanism for rep extracting numerosity from the environment, sorry if I have to use that expression again, and then representing it in their, in their minds. If that's not working very well, uh, then this is a problem because this seems to be the foundation for learning arithmetic. Understanding what the numerosity of a set is, is critical to learning arithmetic. A set has a definite number of members. If you add another member, it changes the numerosity. If you take a member away, it changes the numerosity. So it's, it's very exact, very specific, and it's the difference between a set of five and a set of six, which has just got one more member. So if you're not very good at representing sets and their numerosities, both of which, by the way, are abstract things. I mean, a set is abstract, and the numerosity of a set, the property of a set, also abstract. That's a whole other issue that's plagued philosophers for at least two and a half millennia. The point here is that these people are not very good at the foundations, not very efficient, at the foundations for arithmetic.
So they don't, for example, know that fiveness is just one more than fourness. They can count, okay, but their internal representation's not very good. We, we might speculate how uh, their accumulator doesn't work very efficiently. So if it doesn't work very efficiently, they're not very, they don't have a very reliable representation, let's say, of fiveness. Uh, and that means that the relationship between their representation of fiveness and the digit five or the word five is not very good. And this means that they are really bad at learning arithmetic. They need extra help. Rather in the way that a dyslexic who has a problem relating lesser strings to words has a problem and needs special help. What we've been trying to do is trying to create digital environments in which kids can play around with sets, combine sets together, which is like addition, or separate sets, which is like subtraction, and relate sets to digits and, and to words. We feel that this might help overcome this problem, which is usually called dyscalculia. Now, dyscalculia is actually quite a big problem. I mean, it probably affects something like 5% of the population, and it's been calculated that this costs us at least two and a half billion pounds a year in the UK. So worldwide, if it's 5% of the worldwide population, it's a serious and expensive business. Um, because people who've got dyscalculia have all sorts of consequential life problems, like they're not very good with money, they're not very good at, at work. So it's known to be a, a serious problem in everyday life. One of the first dyscalculics we ever saw was in prison for shoplifting. And the reason he shoplifted was he was too embarrassed to go to the counter with his purchases because he didn't know how much money to give and he didn't know if he was getting the right change. And of course, kids in school you know, the 5% of kids in school who have this problem get this every, well, five days a week because they have uh, um, math lessons five days a week. So one of the things we're trying to do is to help these kids overcome that problem for which you need specialised help. Now, one of the things I'm trying to persuade teachers, educational professionals like educational psychologists and ultimately the government is that the problem with these dyscalculics is that this mechanism that we've seen operating in a whole range of different creatures might be the same in humans, that Johnny is not really as good as Billy on, on these kinds of tasks. We're trying to show that this is an innate problem rather like colour blindness. A small mutation has affected the way in which this accumulator mechanism in the brain has been built, and this, is, this has got long-term long consequences. Unfortunately, the government doesn't recognise it at the moment, and um, other uh, bodies that should be taking it seriously um, are not recognising it either. However, uh, Singapore, which is a country that always comes top or close to top on all international mathematical comparisons, they take it seriously. They say, we've got 10% of kids who need learning support in mathematics. We don't know why they're having this problem, but we'd like to try and help them. At least maybe half of those will be dyscalculics. So we're, we're collaborating with the Singapore government and uh, the National Institute of Education there to try and develop some digital environments in the first place to help these kids overcome their problems. Dyslexia doesn't have this problem of recognition and help, does it? No, it doesn't. One of the reasons, it's thought that if you can't, if, if you're finding reading difficult or spelling difficult, this is a real handicap. And it is a real handicap. Also, a lot of celebrities have come out as dyslexic, uh, showing that it's possible to be successful even though you're dyslexic. However, it's also the case that if, you having, if you've got poor literacy, you've also got worse life chances. But it also turns out that if you've got poor numeracy, you've got even worse life chances than having poor literacy. But why isn't that coming out? Because people think, oh, well, it's, it's okay to say I'm terrible at maths. Um, where it's not okay to say, I'm terrible at language, or I'm terrible at reading, or I'm terrible at spelling, or something like say that. Um, so I think attitudes are a bit different. Also, the other thing is that vastly more money has been thrown at the dyslexia problem 
than uh, has been thrown at the dyscalculia problem, vastly more money, uh, both here in America and Europe. But of course, this is part of what I call the virtuous or the vicious triangle. Because there's no recognition, there's no money. Because there's no money, there's no research. Because there's no research, there's no recognition, and so on. Whereas if we could just intervene in one of those nodes in the triangle, maybe we could make a big difference. If we've got better research, or more research, or more spectacular research, we get more recognition. You get parents who are complaining to their local MP that their children are not getting the right type of help because they're dyscalculic, then government might change their mind. But even though there's a, the British Dyslexia Association and there was Dyslexia Action, and then of course there's autistic uh, societies and ADHD societies, there isn't a Dyscalculia Association, the British Dyscalculia Association. So parents at least bear some of the responsibility here. But of course they don't know that the reason that, that Johnny is not learning arithmetic is because he's dyscalculic. They think either think that Johnny is lazy or Johnny is stupid, but in fact he's not, he's just dyscalculic. Okay, so this is a digital environment that we've created to help dyscalculics, and the idea is that they understand uh, about the relationship between digits and sets, and they understand about what sets are like, 